the USA Pavilion at Dubai Expo 2020. My name is Katherine Johnson, we've met, and I'm just really excited to have you all come today to celebrate March 8th, 2022 is the UN International Day for Women. And so we're here today, not only to celebrate women, but to celebrate women with disabilities and the empowerment of women and women with disabilities. And so you all are friends of the family of women with disabilities, and we wanna to talk today about uh, advocacy and the role of advocacy in empowering women. So we, I wanna give you each an opportunity to introduce yourself, and then we'll start with our first topic. Diane, could you go first, please? Yes, um, I'm Darin Abulein. I'm the Accessibility uh, Outreach Manager in the Students Accessibility Services Department at Zaire University. My job is to work on community initiatives. Um, I'm working with external stakeholders to uh, empower students with determination, students with disabilities, and people uh, with disabilities in the UAE. Great, thank you. Thanks for coming. Fatma? Uh, my name is Fatma Fasimi. I am the Director of Student Accessibility Services at Zaire University. We accommodate students with uh, determination and um, we give them all the support services they need at the university. We also help them later on with their uh, employment. And mostly as we're talking about women, we serve uh, more uh, women students, women with disabilities uh, than men. Okay, great. Thanks for coming on the way to Expo. Shani? Hi, um, I'm Shani Zanza, a disability activist an inclusion specialist uh, in the UK. I'm also a social entrepreneur. I also work to help reduce the extra costs that many disabled people face uh, and a broadcaster as well. Great, thanks for coming all the way to Dubai. And Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Benson. I am the program lead and lecturer on our inclusion and special education needs program at the University of Birmingham at our brand new Dubai campus. So we work training new teachers to become more inclusive in their classrooms here in Dubai and beyond because we know Dubai is a global city. So I have to admit I had never been to Dubai before Expo and Expo I'm realizing really has the power to leverage the networking and bringing people together but I think um, individuals with disabilities have not had an opportunity to really be at that table of discussions at Expos and so we're starting a new chapter. We're starting a new legacy for Expos. We hope that Minnesota gets the bid for 2027. I welcome you all to come to Minnesota for a follow-up square table <laughs> discussion. And uh, having the opportunity though to, to really learn about disabilities and disability policy in this region has been eye-opening for me. And I think more people would be interested in learning more about what is the status of special education and people with disabilities. So if you could share about current disability and what's happening, disability policy and what's happening within the UAE. Could you share? Um, sure. Um, from in, in the UAE, uh, there are the, one of the amazing things that you can find that's when you compare to other countries that there is a federal law that was in 2006, uh, which basically protects the rights of people with disabilities across the UAE and kind of commit uh, all the relevant entities to uh, provide services, adequate services for people of uh, uh, determination. We call we, we say here people of determination for people with disabilities. I think I you know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and me, me too. When I first also joined the yeah. Zion University, I was so impressed and so empowered myself mm -hmm. just to use the term. So having a federal law, it actually makes it easier for entities like ourselves in terms of uh, as universities or even um, uh, other entities. Uh, to actually advocate for the rights of, of uh, people with disabilities and, and kind of encourage families, in, mm -hmm. encourage the community and encourage uh, uh, stakeholders to take an active role in kind of fulfilling these priorities. Also, there's a uh, different policy uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, strategies at the national level. There's the Abu Dhabi strategy, the comprehensive strategy for people with determination. And there's the uh, there's one policy that the Bay also worked on the as, the, as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, the yeah. KHD one, uh, which basically gives a very enabling and rich environment that we can have actually you know, go with full force when it comes to campaigning and providing um, quality uh, uh, advocacy uh, uh, activities and interventions that will tackle and address the uh, needs of uh, people with disabilities in the, in the country. Yes. I think what's so exciting about the UAE, having worked in other places in the Middle East, is that often policies are enacted, like these federal policies, um, and they sit on the books and they just kind of sit there, right? Like 
they're there, but nobody's advocating <laughs> or enforcing them. And right. here, from a grade school perspective, we see the KHDA going in and doing school inspections to make sure they're living up to those inclusive values. Um, we see Apple W schools, they're, they are, their new focus is on inclusion. And so it's not just uh, lip service mm -hmm. here in the UAE. They really are taking it seriously. And obviously you all will speak to the higher education, but um, I think it's so inspiring to work in some of the schools here and see that the laws and the policies mean something on the ground to the teachers who are teaching the students with disabilities here. And also, well. most of all, what I would like to say being an Emirati, yes. I mean, our leadership here, they really encourage yani, inclusion and, and uh, inclusivity. And, and they empower people, and that's how we got the, the name of like people of determination. Because Sheikh Mohammed, he designated this uh, title for people uh, with disabilities, mm -hmm. that he sees them, they are more powerful and they and they achieve a lot. So yeah, the, 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 the title disability really does not really fit with them. It's more like encouraging and more uh, powerful to give the title people of determination. So you we're proud of that. Over, yeah. right? We got and and, and I can, I saw that in the students. I mean, when they first when they heard the name, the new title, they were so excited. They wow. wanted to do more and yeah. more, and, and they were and telling me. I mean, we feel now, you know, like we are empowered, yeah. and and the leadership are behind yeah. us. You know, so it's really great. Well, I feel empowered coming here as a tourist and exactly. somebody that doesn't live in this country. I yeah. love going around and yeah. need to access the service for people of determination. Yeah. Language really matters. Of course. Mm -hmm. And I think for such a young um, city like Dubai is, mm -hmm. we've made a major stride mm -hmm. uh, you know, in disability inclusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. And how about accessibility then for individuals here when we talk about advocacy? That includes getting places and yes. having access to be able to have a voice to advocate. How is that in Dubai? Uh, actually, in Dubai, there's law uh, in the municipality now. They, I mean, any building, any new building, they have to have everything accessible mm. from lifts, from ramps, from everything. And they were also looking into all build, all the building and trying. They, they, I, I, I remember there was a task force mm. with someone I knew that was, he was in it, and they were going around all buildings and if they receive any call like myself even the RTA if we if you call for any place that you see not fit or not accessible straight away they you give them a week or so and it's done and they call you back and tell you this is this is okay it's done. done and it's it's amazing how everybody here in Dubai and the UAE as a whole working together to make like the city uh, accessible especially before expo there yeah. was people were running mm -hmm. running to do everything the right time, even though yeah, we started a while earlier, but mm -hmm. it, and everything was really ready by the time. And it's not just buildings, is it? It's, yes. You go down to the beaches, exactly. you go down to Clay exactly. Beach, and exactly. my grandmother was a wheelchair user, and I, I always think, gosh, she would have loved Dubai, because she loved the beaches, yes. but we could never get to them. Yes. But here we've got, you know, yeah. there's the beaches yeah. are accessible. Yeah. Even in the, in, in the, in the like, uh, parks in Dubai, especially mm -hmm. the beach parks, they have accessible wheelchairs to go into the water, yeah. oh. which is really great. Yeah, and wow. like anybody great. Can, can go and, and yeah. get one of these, even like uh, like older people who are maybe not able to walk. Or, but it, it's amazing. Everything is so inclusive. And yeah. I think that's why Dubai is being a very popular choice for disabled travelers and tourists. Yes. Yes. Because there is that emphasis of, you know, on their accessibility. Yeah. Um, I thought all my friends come here too on holidays. <laughs> so. A lot from yeah. the UK, yeah. very much so. I don't think as many people from the United States, yeah. so we're hoping in the United States. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. yeah. You're a little bit far apart. <laughs> 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 nice, nice, everything was uh, going to be great. Yeah. Great, great. But really, another part of the conversation is focused on the SDGs and being here together having this conversation. SDG 17, the power of networking. Mm -hmm. And I hope that really we can build lasting and sustainable partnerships between our universities, with St. Cloud State and Zaid University of Birmingham, Dubai mm -hmm. as your campus title, and really work to advocate for more students, especially in the area of teaching and young women, uh, having employment opportunities. The purpose of education is, the end goal is for employment, right? Mm -hmm.
So we know for women and young girls with disabilities, the power of education really can help advance their rights. And we're talking about SDG 17 and networking, but we're also focused on SDG 5 especially thinking about the UN International Day for Women that we're celebrating. And so as we think about education, we want to start with the power of inclusive education and the movement and momentum that's happening in Dubai and the UAE, actually in the whole Middle East region. And you really have a lot of expertise with that, Sarah, if you could share. I think it's just so exciting within the region generally. I mean, we talk about the UAE, it's a shining example of what can happen around here. Um, but within the region, we see all countries following the lead. Um, I know that King Abdullah and Jordan recently had a long uh, talk uh, address about inclusive education. But, um, you know, when we think about who is most likely to be excluded from education, it's young women. And then if we think about the intersectionality of women and disability, it's women with disabilities or girls with disabilities. And so if we think about um, disrupting our education system, and inclusive education really is a disrupting factor because we're asking people to think about who really should hold the power and it should be women and girls. And I think it's so exciting to see the inclusive framework here in Dubai, making sure that all of our students with disabilities, all of our students with determination have access to our schools. And it's really this forward looking um, idea of everybody should be included in our schools because then we can all learn from each other. Um, having people uh, go to school together creates that, I think you said it, Catherine, a community of inclusivity so that when they get to higher education, when they get to the workplace, um, people are ready and it's not strange to see somebody with a disability in your community. It's yeah. just part of being a human. Um, it's just a, a natural difference in the world, right? And I think that's the power of inclusive education is that we can really understand that difference is, is normal. Right, right. When we start with inclusive education, we create an inclusive society. Yeah. And so could you share Zayed University yeah. with the uh, amazing work you're doing? For us, really, it's great because Zayed University also, you know, like we have a, the women campus in Zayed University has the majority of students. So, uh, and, and since 2010, we started like providing uh, services to, to people or students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the aim of that was to just to give them equal education opportunities like anybody else. So the, 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 the women who are like disabled or with disabilities, they have the right to be educated just mm -hmm. like anybody else. And education is empowering. So, like starting this uh, uh, department in Zayed University, yeah, I mean, we made sure that they have everything, all the resources are, are accessible for all the, all the students, including uh, students with disabilities, uh, specifically uh, for women, as I said, and also independence. One of the yeah. aims that we were aiming for, because also independence empowered people. And, and a lot of students, when they come to us, especially women, they are very shy, they don't want to, especially with disabilities, they have some kind of, uh, they're vulnerable. They don't want to like be with so many people, especially the university life is totally different than school life. So transi trans transition, transitioning from schools to universities, sometimes that gap, we try to fill it up for them. We train them on, on, on like assistive technology. We give them a lot of sessions, uh, 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 give them, uh, independence, try to include them even like let them work in the department mm -hmm. to to make them more encouraged to be inclusive and to be more like uh, uh, getting ready and, and feeling uh, more empowered with themselves. So the result of that is really amazing because you see the women like before some also some uh, ladies with visual impairment, I, I they come to the university, they don't even want to walk with their cane mm -hmm. because it's they think of the stigma and it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's embarrassing for them because they haven't done it in, their, in all their life. But when they come and we give them the training, we give them mobility training and, and allow them to work, uh, to, to walk through the campus with their canes. So you see the shift, I see the shift with the student walking like this down her head and someone escorting her all the time, being dependent on someone else. And then the difference when she's walking with her head high, mm -hmm. walking with the cane, and so independent. Mm -hmm. So 
the same with the wheelchair users, the same with all the other disabilities. You see the shift in them, and this is really empowering them. This is what makes them more inclusive in activities in the universities and, and around the whole campus. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that you all at, at Zayed University and all of the universities in the UAE are developing these services because as we've seen the inclusive legislation go in at the K through 12 level, mm -hmm. we know that there's going to be more and more students of determination looking for places at universities in higher, in higher education. And so we're really beginning to see that birth to, to adulthood pipeline here. Now they have a place in K through 12. They have places yes. at universities, and then they will have places in the business world and being able to be entrepreneurs or, or whatever they want to do, really. And I was just thinking as you were talking about the majority of women being uh, at your campus, I was thinking most of the women advocates I know, most of the disability advocates I know are women. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Truly right. are disruptive. Many other disciplines as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Many other disciplines as well. Yeah. Women are taking yeah. the lead. Yeah. When the doors are opened, we yeah. will take the world by storm. Yeah. I just think that that's so fantastic that those doors are being opened. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. When I think about inclusive education, and beginning with the little people, yeah. when they come in school in kindergarten and or preschool, a critical factor is the teacher. So can you share about your new program that really is a program of influence for shifting towards inclusive education? And I think it's so important that, you know, in education we often think of inclusive education as something additional or an mm -hmm. add-on. And really working with our teachers to understand that there's nothing additional. It's simply good teaching. Mm -hmm. And understanding that if they de design their classroom, design their teaching to be universal, that they can accommodate all students' differences and everybody's going to learn better. Um, and I think that's really our underlying message with our program. So I'm specifically working with um, our CENCOs, our inclusive leads, um, and some of our LSAs, or learning support assistants. And they come to us to understand more in depth the history of disability and the progress of the inclusive legislation here in Dubai. But they also learn about how to support specific disabilities and accommodations in schools but our larger work is actually to be teacher advocates in our schools. Yes. And one of the biggest things I always emphasize with my teachers is, how can you support your classroom teachers? What can you do to support the classroom teachers so the students come into the classroom and they're always included? Instead of taking our students out, what can we do to make that classroom accessible for all students? Because we really believe that inclusion means that everybody should have the opportunity right. to learn together mm -hmm. through strong pedagogical practices. Um, and it's so exciting to see us creating teachers here in the UAE who are going to stay in the UAE and teach. We all know that it's a very international city and people yeah. come and go. So it's exciting to be producing teachers here who will stay here and teach in the schools and really can have that, that underground. We have similar intervention as well in our, yes. in our university because we, we um, for uh, I think about two or three years now, we're kind of focusing on uh, faculty trainings, basically, mm -hmm. that SAS specialists that do yeah. students with accessibility services is, is doing, which is basically training uh, student, uh, training faculty to work on uh, UDL, that's other yeah, stride. Universal design. Yeah, universal design for learning and also accessibility features the technologies behind it and how can they 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 can use it and it's I there are two things that I would like to share in this regard uh, in Zion University we just fi fi finished deploying the Ally software on our blackboard and then you could see um, while we were doing the trainings for the faculty and the pilot phase that you could see that it is something that they are in, in, being encouraged to do, but it's just you need to set the tone of the reminders, the constant reminders that it's something that you can do on a daily basis and how, how you can actually do it. And I measure by looking at the number of volunteers uh, requests that we get from other students because apparently the, the more that you raise the awareness of the faculty, the more that they talk about it, the more that they use it. And then we have larger number of volunteers from all, whether there are students with disabilities or not, or, or, or the, the other students as well. So we have a huge number of students that they, that they feel that they want to be engaged in the cause. 
they want to be engaged with students with determination, they want to be engaged for themselves as well. They want to learn more about accessibility features. We have students all the time joining our training, especially when we provide, because we do provide trainings uh, for external community um, schools and so on. Right. And we have students all the time that they are interested in accessibility features, use them themselves, whether they have disability or not. Exactly. I use accessibility features yeah. for uh, and I don't <laughs> have a senior disability, but I do. Everyday life and knowingly, like the fact that you can send a voicemail on you know, WhatsApp, that was created as an accessibility feature. Exactly. Like that's something we can all benefit from. And, yeah. and on the topic of universal design, that's a lot of the work that I do with businesses and brands to help them think in a really inclusive way and factor in a whole range of human diversity that exists in the world. Yeah. Because, as you mentioned earlier, disability is just a human experience, and sadly, people are very fearful around disability or disabled people mm -hmm. if they if they're not comfortable yeah. with it, they don't know disabled people. But I think what people are more fearful of is the fact that it could happen to, to, to them at any time. Any time. I think I think that's like fragility more than anything, mm -hmm. and. You know, we've got a stat in the UK that 67% uh, of British people have felt uncomfortable when speaking to a disabled person. Wow. Now we're, you know, we're a relatively progressive country in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Quite um, a huge uh, percentage. It, yeah, yeah, so it just goes to show, um, you know, despite everything, we've got, we've got all the elites, we've got the um, Equality Act, we've got lots of disability advocates and campaigners and and, and, and you know, but to, uh, I just would like to ask mm. something about this. A lot of people, they think maybe people are, you know, like they don't want to deal with, with people with disabilities, but I think the fact is that sometimes they don't know how to, yes. and sometimes yeah. they are yes. afraid, because yes. sometimes, yes. like even our students, sometimes, yeah, I, mean, I, t I tell, I ask the other student, I say, why you don't talk to them? I, say, I don't know what to say, I don't know, maybe they would be offended, they would be upset. Yeah. So once you raise the awareness, yes. and that's what we do in the university, we do a lot of awareness events about different disabilities and all that. So you put them into experience. For example, we do the White King Day every year, yes. and we blindfold the students, all the students who come to the event. We let them you know, live the experience mm -hmm. of a blind person. And they get so much inspired, and they feel great. You know, After that, you see a lot of shift and a lot of change in their attitude and they become more friendly and they can connect together better. Yeah. I just think about how the power of if we could really start this developing that comfort at that yeah. younger age and, yeah. and, and learning how to interact yeah. that that 67% would like yeah. shoot downwards yeah. in the yeah. most wonderful I, way. I also want to share that I have a very visible condition but I have a short stature and out in the public, you know, people obviously look at me in the UK and actually around the world, around the world you know, so people can stare at me, they might take videos and pictures of me, which I do not like. Uh, um, and I'm always struck by how curious and innocent children are, mm -hmm. and then how they get shouted at by their parents. Mm -hmm. So, quite often, this is what will play out uh, there'll be a child and they'll say, Oh, look at that little lady, or look at that little mommy. I think yeah. it's so cute. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the parents are like, shh, don't say that. That's really yeah. bad. That's naughty. So, what adults do is instill that fear yes, into children exactly. Exactly. because they themselves never grew up in an inclusive environment or an inclusive education. Yeah. So, so, we need to recognize that that is happening. Yeah. And I'll happily take you know two minutes out of my day have a chat you know with any yeah, child yeah. and I think it's a brilliant learning opportunity for that parent to just talk about diversity in general yeah, yeah. and I get it like some parents have said to me well you know I'm, I'm afraid it might offend you I'm like there's been way worse things that have offended me this yes. is not you know right. children are innocent right. yes and I think we should all learn. I think, yeah, that. it's also good to work with children from a young age yeah. to let them leave, be more inclusive. That's why it's really inclusion is so good, even among, you know, like from kindergarten yeah. till the grade 12. It's yeah. so good to bring more and more uh, people with different disabilities mm -hmm. to be more included in yeah. the classrooms. Yeah. What you're really all for alluding to is there are four areas that we really have to work on to advance disability rights. Mm -hmm. The policy is important. We yeah. get it on the paper, but like right. you said, on the paper, we need to put it into action. So that mm -hmm. shift is happening here. Mm -hmm. Then we have the economic system that we work with, financial, 
and in, investing in the education, investing in inclusive education and teacher training. And then also we have the education, which we've been talking about. But you four have hit it on the nail that the social cultural values yes. within a community are the most, uh, the greatest barriers that we face yes. mm -hmm. uh, in our community working with uh, individuals with disabilities and especially women and girls with disabilities. And so the next uh, area that we'd like to focus on is employment. That's the lifelong goal of education, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm loving this conversation with all of you and I really, I'm learning a lot. So I hope those who are watching us are also joining in and learning a lot too. We wanna to shift now and talk about uh, education and employment, how education leads to employment for women with disabilities. And our colleagues from Zion University, could you share your dream and your vision for having young women with disabilities have gainful employment? Okay, I'll, I'll start with the, of course, when we started the departments only right now, it's 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So our graduates really like, um, like now we have only like from five years ago started graduating. Okay, yeah. uh, and they were, the number was much smaller and now it's growing and growing. But the good thing that yeah, what, what we do, we prepare our students because sometimes employers, they are afraid to recruit yeah. people with disabilities. You yeah. know, they think, oh, they can't really fulfill the job requirements. They won't be as, as you know, as, you know, like um, uh, giving more or like they uh, active in the, in the job place. But what, I mean, what we do, we prepare our students to be, as I said before, more and more independent to be able also to, to, to fulfill the job requirements. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to like graduating and, and, and employers recruit them, we have a specialist from our department that oh. did go, she goes to the yeah. workplace and she, she prepares the student like with, with the mobility, with the training uh, and to the work environment. Mm -hmm. She also goes through the job description and uh, you know, and try to see the the, the, the the graduate, they are familiar with those responsibilities and all that. And we make sure that each of our students, they get the right job. Because sometimes some companies or like organization, what they do, they just want to fill the, the, the you know, they, yeah. they tick the box. Correct. But they have the quota and they want to yeah. fulfill that. And that's what I don't allow it. They said, okay, just send me the names of your graduates and then we will contact them. I said, no, you have to, send me the list of your jobs, mm -hmm. vacancies, and we will see what job fits with our graduates mm -hmm. according to their majors, according to their capabilities, and according to their also passion. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, yeah. they, they, they yeah. have the right to decide where they're going to work and how they're going to, and where, where exactly. So that's what we do, which is really great. And we've been having very good connection with the employers Excellent. because we are also, you know, like, um, supporting them because they feel sometimes afraid to, to recruit mm -hmm. those students or graduates but we do yani, a lot of work mm -hmm. with them so that we can yani, they can feel uh, and once they have the students or the graduates they are great and they yeah. feel you know yeah, they're doing their job very very well and they are even doing more than the, the and, and it's not and mm -hmm. I don't know whether there is any statistics but I know from myself yani, I am also I have polio and I feel I want to give more to the society. I feel I want to do more for my job because you know, this is my job and I, I am proud. Yeah. And I'm and proud that be. I have this ability and still yeah. be able to do this job. Yeah. We do have some data in the UK on that. Okay. Just speaking to a point that you mentioned around okay. how employers think disabled uh, people are less productive mm -hmm. or they might be risky hires yes. or might need lots of time off work. Yeah. Actually what the research tells us is the complete opposite. Yes. Disabled employees are most loyal, yeah. they are very productive and we are safe in the workplace because we are more aware of health and safety things just because of the way in which we live mm -hmm. and we cost less because we are less likely to, to jump from employer to employer. Yeah. So it's really interesting, that narrative. However, what I do think also contributes to some of that is that we as disabled employees massively feel that we have to overcompensate yes. to yes. get in work so and that's, stay that's in work. Like, yes, exactly. So although I'm British, um, my heritage is Indian. My parents are Indian. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so intersectionality really played out for me when I was looking for employment. And no one ever really encouraged me and my family to go to university. And no one ever really encouraged me to go out and work. Yeah. It was expected, like I have been said to me that I'm, you don't have to work, you can just claim benefits, can't you? Yeah, this is the and sad I think, thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I was horrified. Like people that knew me were saying that to me. Yeah. I wanted to work and I wanted to contribute to society. And when I finally got round to it at the age of 16, Sadly, I had to apply for over, over 100 jobs before removing any mention of my condition. And then I got an interview and then I got a job straight away. So I had to learn a really harsh life le lesson at 16 that people are going to judge my um, ability based on my appearance. Yes, yes. So that, that all played out. I think that you're a woman to that. Really yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Yes. Awesome. Awesome, it's fantastic. Thanks so much, Commissioner. Yep, so uh, thank you so much because your lived experience and sharing your perspective um, yeah. is really helpful for people yeah. to understand yeah. and the contributions that Zayed University is making and contributing to society and helpful, gainful employment is fantastic. What I heard you saying, Zayed University is really fulfilling a role that within the United States is through vocational rehab services. And so we have whole organizations that are set up to do that transition for mm -hmm. people, individuals mm -hmm. with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's an area that we have at St. Cloud State is a rehabilitation studies program mm -hmm. that um, we would love to partner with you on building capacity, uh, both for individuals with disabilities and individuals without disabilities. We need both, you know, mm -hmm. one billion people are estimated to have a disability in the world. We need one million advocates to help and rally and more than that and uh, having a voice at the table is such a critical piece of the work that we do. I want to close by just saying that the SDGs, we focused on SDG 17, mm -hmm. partnerships, that's I see totally happening here, and SDG 5, gender equity, obviously empowering women, right? What do you think about all the other SDGs? Are they significant for women and girls and especially women and girls with disabilities? <laughs> Go for it. Oh my God. <laughs> and, I mean, and coming from a human background back in the days, um, um, basically the, the SDGs were built to be circular, so they, they feed into, it, into each other. And for me, it's a dear topic when we talk about, so for a woman or a girl with a, with a disability or without a disability, when we come to her inclusion into society and to do a different discipline that's already a question mark in there and already a difficulty add to it the disability part mm -hmm. add to it if she's divorced add to it if she doesn't have education mm -hmm. add to it if she's um, uh, even if, he, if she's from a certain ethnicity or, or all the different variables that, that can look into so like looking at the at, at the women and kind of how they, they did, how gender kind of intersect with all the different SDGs is key especially when it comes to education and in Zayed University, our mission is to qualify and equip our mission statement actually of, of the department to, to their transition into, into employment and working into partnership with the employers and so on to, to be able to do that and also to make sure that we are raising awareness on all of this. But then there is the cultural element out of it, there is the policy element out of it that we, we need to jump in between. Now the SDGs that kind of provide the enabling environment, are they fully utilized? Do I feel that Everyone takes them seriously, not necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see that there are enough conversations and discussions around that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we should, we can do more when it comes to that. And actually, now that I'm in the middle of designing some community outreach programs, I kind of these discussions really helping me to kind of, you know what? Maybe we could focus a little bit on that, and that's helping. But then, um, in, in terms of the, that intersection. I think one of the major things that we should be investing more is the research part of it and actually studying that intersection. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and you know, I'm a bit disturbed. So every time on 8th of, um, of March, I send a message to all the important women, women in my life. I just do that personally speaking. I just so send them. Look at a message. Yes. <laughs> you know, thank you for making me who I am because I was built by, even I don't have a disability, I do have other things in my life that makes me different, but then. If I look back, I am the person I am today because of the good women that supported me and mentored me. So I do send them this message, 
But then, you know, some people say, oh, oh my God, you like the gender people, and then you're kind of advocating for this, and, and this is like becoming cliche, and then you're adding all the different challenges. You know, but everybody has challenges. I'm like, yeah, everybody has challenges, and we need to take them one by one. But mm. some people also have privilege, and don't use that privilege to help others that don't have it. Yeah. So that's really important to, mm. to I think, say to those people that say to you, everyone has challenges. We all do, but they're all different. Yeah. They're not the same. We're not all starting from a different, you know, place, are we? Mm. Yeah. yeah. And as you talk about women and women who have made an influence in our lives and created us for being the person we are, think about your mom. Yeah. <laughs> and the role that she played. My mom was a huge advocate for individuals with disabilities, and that became part of my DNA and who I am. Regretfully, we lost her, but I want to do a shout out to my mom and say, thank you, mom. I am grateful for the opportunity. I'm thankful for who she helped me become. What would you say to your mom? Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> I come from, um, I always joke about the Recknell women. Um, so I would do a shout out to my grandmother mm, yeah. for raising my mom to be so amazing and I would do a shout out to my mom who gets very upset because she has two daughters living around the world <laughs> it is a testament to yes yeah. how she raised us to be strong and independent mm -hmm. and to be curious about the people around us to listen to lived experiences so that we can best experience the world so thanks mom yeah, yeah. yeah my mom is equally amazing um, and I think she really instilled in me that life was probably going to be a bit, a little bit harder for me, but she never treated me any differently from my siblings, and I really, really, really respect her for doing that. Um, and yeah, I think she just taught me how to handle how to handle life and people, because that's a lot of what it takes when you live in a world that isn't designed for you. Um, so yeah, thanks, Mum. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I'd like to say thank you to my mother for believing in me, having having uh, had polio since I was two and a half years old. So it was it must have been very difficult for her to have a child with with disability during you know like any uh, when the time when the people didn't know what is disability, they didn't know how to deal with them. So having believing in me and that, and also giving me as as you said also didn't treat me any different than any other of my my siblings yeah. and then uh, I was really uh, 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 sent to education being sent abroad to, to study yeah. abroad that was a, a big decision yeah. that my parents had to make it was very difficult I mean um, I, I, I traveled to England to study when I was very young so uh, it was hard for them but in the same time they believed in me they, they thought that I was special but not special in a negative way, yeah. special in a good way that I can be something and I make I can make something for myself. Yeah. So I would like Very to really proud. thank them for that. Okay, great. And you? Um, I think my mom is the reason why she challenged the whole patriarchy system where I live in. And she paved the way and had to deal with all, she protected me from the society to become the person I am. I was allowed to travel the other females in, in the family were not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to to be with whomever I want to be. I was, and, I, and I, I say I was allowed because the others were not allowed. Yeah. So she, and she's still doing that. Like having, like being a single person living in the UAE, working on my own, regardless if I am in my thirty, is a, is, is questionable. Mm -hmm. And she still got my back. Mm -hmm. oh, so I thank I love her for it. that. She still got my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what they give yeah. us, right? Right. Yeah. And you know, as mothers, we never know if we're going to be gifted with having a child with a disability. So mm -hmm. I want to end with saying the power to a mother who has a child with a disability. Your mom's testimony. I'm a mother of a child with a disability, and what a gift. Um, in our lives that they are. And so I really want to thank all of you for being here today. This has been more than fun. This has been really insightful, informative, and we will have this on the campus of St. Cloud State University in our Center Yay. for International Disability Advocacy and Diplomacy at Minnesota Expo 2027. Sure. I hope you can come. <laughs> 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 <laughs>